It's lovely to have such a full house tonight. Tonight we have something slightly different. We have Ben Shapiro, man that needs no introduction. I'm just going to run through the format slightly for the evening. So Ben's going to come. He's going to give a quick 10 minute or so address from the dispatch box here, after which we're going to retire to the chairs uh, to have an opening interview. And then our selected student speakers here at the front will take it in turns to ask one probing question, I believe. Um, and then after that, we will retreat to audience questions uh, when everyone can have the chance to stick up their hands um, and ask Ben what they want. So, so uh, without further ado, can I announce Mr. Ben Shapiro? Well, thank you for having me. See. Hello. Is this working? No? This one? No, it's working. It's, it's working. It's working. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. It's very kind of you to offer. Last week, this university's opera society announced that it would be canceling a performance of George Frederick Handel's Saul. That opera, of course, tells the biblical story of King Saul, the first king of the Jews, and his conflict with the soon-to-be King David. So why precisely was this performance of this great work of art canceled? Max Mason, director of the show, explained, quote, given the parallels of this conflict, the production team made the difficult decision to cancel Saul. We came to the unanimous conclusion that our production was not in the place to fully confront the issues that have striking synchronicity with the ongoing Middle East conflict. So what exactly were those striking parallels? In the opera, David kills Goliath, a Philistine. The Jew wins, the Philistine loses. This is apparently in some way offensive. Offensive, perhaps, to those who sympathize with those who slaughter babies in their cribs and rape and kidnap women en masse, who shoot Holocaust survivors in the head and bind together parents and children before burning them alive. It is no coincidence that the statement from the Cambridge Opera Society avoided all mention of Hamas in describing the, quote, unfolding situation in Gaza. Now, this makes no sense. Never mind that the Philistines literally have nothing to do with the Palestinian Arabs of today. The Philistines were likely Mycenaean Greeks. Never mind that the story of David and Saul lies at the root of Judeo-Christian culture, raising serious and fascinating questions about power and morality. Never mind the spectacular music of Handel. The opera had to be canceled, lest the supporters of barbarians be offended. The same week the Opera Society canceled Handel, the Cambridge Student Union considered a motion blaming Hamas's slaughter of innocents on, quote, decades of violent oppression of the Palestinian people by the Israeli state, and demanding that the Student Union, quote, condemn the British government's support for the Israeli state. That same motion called for a mass uprising on both sides of the Green Line and across the Middle East. The barbarians and their supporters, unfortunately, are inside the gates. That is why anti-Semitic hate crime is up 1,350% in London over the past few weeks. That is why imams shout in Nottingham, O oh Muslim, here is a Jew behind me, kill him. And that is why 100,000 people march in London in support of Hamas. So let's take a moment to consider an obvious question. How is it that at this prestigious institution of intellectual achievement and so many others like it, there is now a powerful coalition of interests making excuses for terrorist groups. The answer to that question is decades in the making. And the story begins with Western apologism. Much of the West has spent the past few decades apologizing not for its sins, which you should apologize for, but for its very existence. The West's sins, so the logic goes, are so deep and abiding that they can only have sprung from the inherent evils of Western philosophy and culture, and the only corrective is Western suicide. The West, the argument goes, must quote-unquote decolonize itself. That argument originally springs from the pen of Francophone radical Franz Fanon in his 1961 book, The Wretched of the Earth. Fanon, a member of the Algerian National Liberation Front, put forth a shockingly violent treatise calling for revolution of the colonized against their colonizers. Fanon didn't merely call for the end of colonialism a la Gandhi. Instead, he called explicitly for violence, which he saw as purifying in all of its varied forms. Fanon theorized that revolutionary violence would usher in the new man, free from the evils of the West. Decolonization, he wrote, is always a violent event. Decolonization, he wrote, which sets out to change the order of the world, is clearly an agenda for total disorder. In its bare reality, Fanon wrote, decolonization reeks of red-hot cannonballs and bloody knives. Violence, disorder, bloody knives. That's the essence of Fanon's decolonization. The colonized must take everything from the colonizer in the name of restoring himself as a human being. Decolonization justifies any response. In fact, it requires any response. 
the West must be destroyed, for the West has colonized. Quote, when the colonized hear a speech on Western culture, they draw their machetes, or at least check to see they are close at hand, says Fanon. When the colonized hear handle Saul, they pick up a machete. Such hatred of colonial power was at least somewhat understandable in Algeria. But Fanon wasn't merely making the case for revolutionary violence in Algeria. He was making the case for revolutionary violence pretty much everywhere. The man who made that clear was existentialist and Marxist Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre's introduction to Fanon's Wretched of the Earth makes the case not only that the colonized have an ultimate right to violence, but that the entire West must be collapsed from within. Violence, says Sartre, is man reconstructing himself. Killing a European is killing two birds with one stone, eliminating in one go oppressor and oppressed, leaving one man dead and the other man free. The only honorable thing for the West to do is join in on its cultural suicide. Quote, you who are so liberal, so humane, who take the love of culture to the point of affectation, you pretend to forget that you have colonies where massacres are committed in your name, writes Sartre. We must recognize, he explains, that we are all complicit in, quote, a thousand-year oppression. Our beloved values are losing their features. If you take a closer look, there is not one that isn't tainted with blood. So how exactly does the West recover from its guilt? By joining in on the violence against our own civilization. And how can we tell the enemy? Well, you attack the powerful. The colonizers are the powerful. The colonized are the powerless. Therefore, the powerful everywhere must be the colonizers and the powerless their victims. This is how, for example, Israel, the ultimate case of decolonization in human history after a turn of a native population to its homeland and its battle to throw off the shackles of the British Empire, became today's hottest decolonization cause. Sartre's radical call has been taken up sporadically both at home and abroad. As critical theorist Homi Baba points out in his foreword to Fanon's book, the Black Panthers found inspiration in Fanon, so did the Iranian revolutionaries. The false binary, oppressor versus oppressed, can be transmuted into literally any form and used by any evil cause. And it is. Now, the coalition of Fanon's wretched of the earth, that's his phrase, of course, could not materialize immediately. Despite the emptying of churches and the deconstruction of Western curricula, so long as the Soviet Union loomed as a counterexample to the evils of the West, the West could still stand up for itself in contradistinction to the vicious predations of the Soviets. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, the West lost its way. The West, now completely dominant, hegemonic, believed it had reached Francis Fukuyama's end of history, that Western liberalism would now inherently dominate the globe. But the West was unprepared to defend its own principles on their own merits. The West, by actually achieving hegemony, opened itself wide to the charge that it was now the great oppressor. In the words of deconstructionist Jacques Derrida, writing in Critique of Fukuyama, quote, it must be cried out at a time when some have the audacity to neo-evangelize in the name of the ideal of a liberal democracy that has finally realized itself as the ideal of human history, never have violence, inequality, exclusion, famine, and thus economic oppression affected as many human beings in the history of the earth and of humanity. That, of course, was a radical lie. Suggesting that 1991 was the apex of human suffering is simply ridiculous. But the West was unprepared to defend against the lie, having emptied itself of the central pillars of its own culture decades before, having, over, having handed over its major educational institutions to members of the anti-Western coalition in the name of tolerance and diversity. No wonder Sartre's radicalism has now become a mass movement, a mass movement starting on campus but not ending there. Cornel West, a black Marxist radical who's now running for president in the United States, says that colonialism isn't a, quote, far from home problem. The West must be demolished. For Fanon, West says, revolutionary internationalism, anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, anti-patriarchal, anti-white supremacist, yields a new humanism that puts a premium on the psychic, social, and political needs of poor and working peoples, a solidarity and universality from below. This is how the coalition is built. And the coalition is now active. The alliance of the supposedly marginalized march together arm in arm toward the destruction of the West. Nothing need bind them but hatred for the West's institutions and values. And that is why Handel will not be played in deference to fans of Hamas at one of the great institutions in Western history. But Handel should be played. He must be played because the West values are better than the values of Hamas. Because powerlessness alone does not confer moral decency. Because no one should actually be ashamed or upset that David killed Goliath. The capital P, Philistines of yesterday, have become the Philistines, small p, of today. And those Philistines do indeed march alongside Hamas and its allies, seeking the destruction of the West and its culture. They must be stopped. And they can only be stopped if the West stops being ashamed of itself and begins to defend its own values. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. 
I think there's a lot there that our members will want to touch on later. Um, so what we're going to try and do now is just try and cover quite a broad range of topics um, to give us some background. Um, you talk there about Western values there. Um, and what I think when we see and when we look to the US is perhaps um, an absence of Western values, particularly when we think about democracy. Um, we look to Trump, um, who claims various claims about the election. Um, and then we see in the Republican race at the moment that he's on, what, plus 48 or something? Um, do we think it's an inevitability then that he's going to gain the nomination? I would say inevitability is a bit strong, but certainly he has the upper hand in the nomination process. It would be very surprising if he didn't win the nomination, given his polling lead at this point. Mm -hmm. and, and you're a known critic of him, obviously. Um, but given the lawsuits, the January the 6th riots and all that, um, do you think there's nothing that he could do um, whereby he wouldn't maintain his appeal in the light of his followers? I think it'd be very difficult to undermine his appeal because there are such massive trust problems in the United States. There's no sort of common source of facts, number one. Number two, uh, there's been pushes, both legitimate against Trump and illegitimate against Trump, and those, been, those have now been conflated by his supporters into all opposition to Trump is fundamentally illegitimate. And that obviously is not true. Some of the things said about Trump, that he's a Russian stooge, that he's working for Vladimir Putin, that kind of stuff, that was false. Uh, the, the argument that, that Donald Trump doesn't particularly have a lot of care for the institutions of democracy is clearly true. Um, but supporters, because of the binary nature of American politics, and because everything is so polarized right now, tend to resonate to every critique of Trump as though it is equally false to the Russia, Russia, Russia stuff that, that Trump is constantly talking about. And so it's very difficult to sort of break that stranglehold. And, and I mean, let, let's be real about what Trump is. Trump is not a, a policy solution to a policy problem. What Trump is is a giant orange pulsating middle finger. To, to a lot of the uh, so-called elites in, in America, people who believe that they have, quote unquote, better values and who live on the coast. Well, what you're watching in America play out, and, and Trump is just the avatar of this, uh, is, is a breaking culture. And you're seeing that in, in broader scale via the sorting of population that's happening, where people who are more conservative, like my family, we lived in California, which is a blue state. We moved from California to Florida, which is a red state. And you're seeing a lot of that happen both ways, although the, the net migration right now is very heavily toward, toward the red states. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the other topic of conversation in the US at the moment is obviously the Speaker of the US House. Um, would you say when Kevin McCarthy was quite unceremoniously kicked out, do you think he deserved it? No, I think that was ridiculous and stupid um, you know, and, and served virtually no purpose. Uh, Matt Gates. this is again another incentive problem in American politics right now. Uh, Yuval Levin has, has pointed out, he's a philosopher in the United States, and, and he's pointed out that it used to be that people entered institutions in order to be shaped by those institutions. You went to Cambridge to be shaped by Cambridge. You entered Congress in order to be shaped by Congress and become a Congress person. Uh, and now people use institutions as platforms. And so what you see more and more often in Congress, and this is a bipartisan problem, uh, is Congress people who are getting elected not to do the work of being in Congress, but instead to get on TV, to have a podcast. It, they, they want to do it. I do for a living, right? And, and so what they've decided to do is use electoral office as a platform to do what I do for a living. And what that ends up with very often is complete practic political inability and a lot of grandstanding, a lot of grandstanding. So Matt Gaetz, who, who's the one who overthrew McCarthy, right? Eight Republicans voted along with every Democrat to get rid of McCarthy. Matt Gaetz had no plan. I mean, his, his entire plan was just to make a big fuss and then to essentially lie, I think, to the American people by saying that something better would certainly come along when the incentives are not aligned that way. First of all, I think that the greatest lie in politics is that it's really just a matter of kicking the bums out and getting new bums. I don't think that's the way that, that politics works. As Thomas Sowell has suggested, if you really want to make a change in politics, you have to change the incentive structures, not just change the people. You can change the people, but that's not changing the underlying incentive structure, so the decision-making process stays very similar. Mm. But so, so we do have a change of person now. We have Mike Johnson, um, who's very much an unknown in the UK, certainly. In the US, too. Nobody, the US nobody's US heard too. of him oh, until five course, minutes ago, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you think we can expect from Congress under his leadership? Um, I think very much the same sort of thing. I think that you will see him get more leeway from Matt Gates because it's Matt Gates' fault that he's there. So I, I think that what you'll see is that the Republicans are going to solidify more around Johnson than they were around McCarthy, which means he'll actually, ironically, have more leeway to cut deals over budgets and, and things with Democrats. Right? McCarthy had very little leeway because he was afraid he was going to get kicked out. Well, now Gates can't pull the same trick twice. And so the question is, who kicks him out if he signs, if he signs a continuing resolution or something? He'll have a little bit more leeway to work. Mm. Okay. Um, and then, as I said, we're going to try and cover quite a wide range. So looking back over here to the UK, it being where we are, um, I want to touch briefly on populism. Um, so post-Brexit, post-Boris, post-Corbyn, we now have something some have referred to as a bit of the battle of the boards. 
um, Sunak, Starmer. Um, so do you think that the much sort of vaunted rise of populism um, in the UK, in the US, um, do you think that's sort of diminished now? Are we entering more of a serious period? Um, I, I wish we were entering more of a serious period. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of populism. I, I don't actually think that populism is a philosophy. I think it's an appeal. Uh, you, you see left-wing populists who look like Bernie Sanders in the United States and right-wing populists who look like Donald Trump in the United States. And very often they sort of agree on this quasi-conspiracy theory that whatever you do is not your fault. There are, there are forces at work at play that are really deciding your fate. And so only I can solve, right? That's something that Trump said, but it's certainly something that Bernie could have said. And so I, I, I'm not a big fan of that because I, I really don't think the government is particularly good at solving a lot of people's problems. Uh, when, when it comes to you know, more boring politics, I certainly think that there is going to be a revolt of the middle in a lot of these countries where people say, I'm tired of the spectacular. All I want is just somebody who's going to sit in the chair and do the basic job and, and leave me alone. And as I've said in the United States, I think that first party to sanity wins. Uh, and, you know, obviously everyone in the room literally will know British politics better than I do. I would assume that maybe some of the same forces are at work. Mm -hmm. um, talking of sanity then, um, the NHS. So you, you've said many times um, that you believe that healthcare is not a right. Um, that's obviously very different to what uh, the vast majority um, of the UK believes. Uh, but do you believe there's any sort of benefit uh, to the structure of our healthcare system in the UK, to the sort of nationalised social system? Is there anything there that you could see that might improve the system in the US? I mean, there are certainly many things that could improve the system in the US. Whether the NHS is the solution to that problem, I have serious doubts about. The NHS has serious structural problems in terms of its spending, in terms of its cost, in terms of its debts, in terms of the, the future growth of the NHS. Uh, and all of those are, are things that politicians are going to kick down the can until disaster arrives, which is usually the story with literally every social system. In the United States, that would be Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Um, but you know, as far as could the United States system be improved, sure. I mean, there, there are plenty of different models that I think work better than the United States system, ranging from Singapore to Switzerland. Uh, the, and, and they have various different wrinkles to them, ranging from you know, privately sold health care that's mandated to you know, cooperative health care in certain areas. It, there, there are a lot of different models for it. My, my generalized objection to nationalized health care is that inevitably you'll end up with somebody who is not you making a decision about your health care. And, and that, that person is going to inevitably going to have to take some cost into account. And you are not really part of that process. And that seems to me incredibly dangerous. As far as my statement that, that health care is not a right, I mean that very specifically. I think that we really, really over broadly use the word right. Like all the time we use it and we use it, it's a semantically overloaded term. So a right can simultaneously mean a thing that's good for you to have, which is not a right. That's, that's, that's a thing that's good for you to have. It's not the same thing. Right? I, I, I love having pizza. That doesn't mean that I have a right to pizza. Uh, it does mean, however, that the government does not have the ability to stop me from having pizza or should not have that ability. So in that sense, I do have a right to have pizza. So I don't have a right to have pizza provided by you, but I do have a right to have pizza that the government cannot prohibit me from having. Right? So, so I think that we have to be very clear what we, what we mean when we say that somebody has a right to a thing. Uh, there's a, a legal theorist in the early, late 19th, early 20th century uh, named William Hofeld, and he broke down rights into, into four separate categories, ranging from privileges to immunities, uh, things that you're morally apathetic about, so you have a, a right to choose on a moral level, whether to have a hamburger or not today, as long as you're not a vegan. Uh, and, uh, and that's a matter of apathy. Um, so that's a matter of moral apathy. But you also have rights that are immunities from government, where you don't want the government pragmatically to have enough power to stop you from doing a thing, even if you think that that thing is immoral, because the government with that power can too broadly apply it. So I think we have to be very clear when we say, when I say healthcare is not a right, I don't mean that it isn't a good thing to have. Healthcare is an amazing thing to have and a necessary thing to have. I do mean that you do not have a right to demand that somebody else provide you that health care. That right does not exist. Um, and then one final question before we get some saucy ones from the floor. Um, when we invited you here today, when we announced um, that you were coming, there was a lot of criticism, a lot of controversy. Um, we're obviously a free speech society, but what do you think that says about free speech? I mean, people were there was a lot of different words used, but it, it, it was um, slightly unpleasant to some, might say. Well, what do you think that says Tribe about me, free man. speech? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, what does that say about free speech? Yeah. It, it says that speech, free speech is, is thriving. I've never objected to people who protest or, or ask difficult questions of me. I mean, that's, that's legitimately the process. And so whenever there are people who are upset that I'm coming, you know, as long as I'm still able to come, that's their prerogative and they're perfectly, I'm, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Super. Okay. Um, let's get on to the questions from the floor then. So if you want to take your place at the dispatch box, uh, we're going to move to our first question. So please. Uh, hi, Ben. 
Howdy. Uh, so over, la over the last uh, couple of weeks, you've been uh, making this point that there's no moral equivalency between what Hamas did on October 7 and uh, what Israel's response has been. Uh, but do you think there is a point at which the civilian death toll no longer justifies the actions of Israel? Or do you think that alternatively, uh, Israel can justifiably kill every last civilian as long as its goal is to destroy Hamas. So Israel should do its best to avoid killing civilians in destroying Hamas. However, there is no number where it goes from every life obviously being valuable. There's no number, however, where it goes from 10,000 to 10,001, at which point it has entered the realm of disproportion. That's not how war works. If war worked that way, no one would ever win one. It also completely destroys, I talked about incentive structures, it destroys the incentive structure for for military units to act in ways that do not put civilian lives in danger to allow Hamas immunity by dint of the fact that they are deliberately hiding among civilian populations. If you actually want people to not hide among civilian populations, then there have to be serious penalties to those groups for, for doing that sort of thing. Providing a ceasefire to the terrorist group as they hide under the ground is precisely the reverse of that. But do you not realize that in using Hamas's disregard for civilian life to justify Israel's action, you are establishing the same equivalency that you are rejecting. In, uh, please explain. Uh, if you say that uh, Hamas is hiding behind civilians, therefore we have a right to uh, go after Hamas, despite the fact that we will get a lot of civilians in the way, you're, you're, you're using the fact that your enemy is evil to justify your own evil actions. No, I'm, I'm lamenting the fact that the enemy is evil. That's a different thing. I'm lamenting the fact that Hamas is hiding beneath civilians, and I'm suggesting that if Israel has to get done what it has to get done, that that lies with Hamas. That's not, it's not, it's not, the death of civilians here is unjustifiable across the board, but is blameworthy on Hamas's part. There's a difference between death being justifiable in these circumstances in the sense that it's ever morally praiseworthy or good, and where you place the blame for that death. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty obvious moral point. I mean, to, to, to suggest that it's somehow, it's somehow a celebration of the death of civilians to point out that Hamas is hiding beneath them is to miss the point entirely. The entire point is that it's horrifying what Hamas is doing. If, if Hamas wants to end this all today, all they have to do is surrender. That's literally all they have to do. They have to walk out of the tunnels with their arms up and hand the hostages back to the Israelis, and this all goes away literally tomorrow. So all of this moral heartburn that people are having over Israel attempting to destroy a terrorist group that just murdered 1,500 civilians in their beds, including babies, burned alive in ovens. The, the heartburn over that, because Hamas has simultaneously mistreated its own citizens, and so that's somehow Israel's responsibility. So Israel has to allow its own civilians to be put at risk because Hamas is deliberately putting its civilians at risk. Hamas is the governing body in the Gaza Strip. They've robbed, they've robbed their own citizens blind to the tune of billions of dollars. They have a $500 million investment portfolio in real estate around the globe, while 80% of their citizens are living in poverty. They took all the water pipes out of the ground and carved them into rockets, and somehow Israel is supposed to stop from deposing them because they're so cruel to their own civilians, that, that logic doesn't work in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like, to ask a, I'd like to ask a question on the topic of universal basic income. So last year, Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, said that universal basic income was an idea whose time had come as he spoke on the cost of living crisis. Today, the Welsh government is running a, a, tri a pilot guaranteed income scheme, and England has just launched a similar trial. Do you believe that universal basic income is something that can reduce poverty and guard the workforce from potential technological advances such as AI or automation? I'm not a huge fan of the idea of universal basic income, except as a possible replacement for all the other welfare schemes. So if you were to take all the other welfare schemes, which are badly administered, and basically wrap them into one and call it UBI as a substitute or replacement, it still wouldn't be my ideal, but I think that it might be better. Uh, as far as the, the effect of universal basic income, the question obviously is at what level? How much does it disincentivize work? There have been various attempts at this. Some have been discontinued because they've been failures. Others are, are still continuing, obviously. And so we're waiting to see the impact or effect of that. Uh, the other problem is that when you give a universal basic income to everyone, the natural effect of that is to increase prices, which requires more universal basic income, which requires increased prices, which requires more universal basic income. Helicopter money tends to create inflation. I know that's something that over the past 40 years seemed to be 
not a concern, but obviously now it's a major concern. And it turns out that when you just spend money through a fire hose, as every Western government did in the year 2020, 2021, 2022, that that increases prices. Well, essentially, 2020 was a great experiment in universal basic income. In the United States, everybody just got paid to stay home. I mean, the government just blew out the money, and, and we're still seeing the effects of that. So uh, I have a hard time believing that a, a solid, real universal basic income for millions of people wouldn't have a similar effect on, on price wage spirals, on disincentivization of work, uh, and, and on the fiscal health of a country. Okay, but do you not believe that, firstly, during the pandemic, we saw uh, this huge increase in welfare payments with very little changes in taxes, if anything, there was less, less taxation, and by providing a universal basic income, we're giving individuals the opportunity to choose and decide what they, what they decide to spend their money on and whether they want to allocate that on health or on education. And does that not align with the liberal values which you so regularly preach? So, I mean, if, again, as a substitute for other forms of welfare, I generally agree. I also see a, a train running down the track, which is what happens when a lot of people use their universal basic income to buy lotto tickets, which is one of the problems, right? Very, very often in the United States, for example, you have to, you have, our, our welfare programs are means tested, uh, and they are very often specifically allocated to particular goals. So for example, EBT cards in the United States are for food stamps. You can only use them for particular products. Giving people cash, if they spend, those th if they spend their cash on things that keep them in poverty, and then come back to the government with their handout saying, well, I didn't pay for my health care, I didn't pay for my kids' schooling, I didn't pay for the school books, but I definitely paid for my lottery ticket. I have a feeling the same people who are now advocating for universal basic income will, will be looking back to the government to fill that gap again. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ben, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is your view on the fact that bans on abortion do lead to about a 21% increase in pregnancy-related deaths when you hold that your views on abortion and abortion bans are based in the fact that you have a desire to protect life and save lives because every human being is made in God's image? Because I think we're going to have a fundamental disconnect here. The entire abortion debate is centered on whether indeed a, an unborn child or a, or a human life with potential is in fact that or if it is just a ball of cells. If you believe that there is inherent value to a fetus, then I am seeking to preserve that life as well as the life of the mother. If you look at the raw numbers in terms of, for example, in the United States, a million abortions a year, let's assume that laws banning abortion in the United States were universal, those million abortions go away tomorrow. That's an effective law, the abortions go away, but there's also a concomitant increase in the number of women who are seeking back alley abortions, for example. There's a concomitant increase in the number of women who are dying in pregnancy-related childbirth. That would not be a million. That would be a lot lower than a million. Because a million women out of a million women, that would suggest that a million abortions would, if, if brought to term, a million of those women would die. That's obviously not true. So for me, an abortion prevented is a life saved. And you have to weigh that against what you're talking about, which is the life of, of the mother when it comes to a pregnancy. Now, even as a, a fan of, of pro-life position, and I am, I'm, I'm a deeply pro-life person, I still have an exception for the life of the mother. So if the life of the mother is endangered by a pregnancy, then abortion would be legal. That's true for every pro-lifer in the United States, by the way, including the most pro-life people, including me. So you know, the, the, I think that in order to make the argument that you're making, you would have to assume that there is no cost to abortion remaining legal in terms of lives lost. Okay, so you're doing it on a utilitarian basis. On, well, I'm doing it on a lives saved basis, yes. Well, yeah, so, so, a, so util sure, a utilitarian yes, basis. Sure, sure. Right. So, then if you look at comprehensive sex education, which the US does not have, a lot of people in rural areas don't have any form of sex education, you yourself have said, and I quote, um, on a general level, I don't think that teachers should be talking about sex in the classroom with kids at all at any age. Um, it's shown that comprehensive and correct sex education reduces rates of abortion and teen pregnancy. So then if your goal is to save lives, why do you not support comprehensive sex education? Because it I, seems like your goal is something else. No, because the, the, first of all, I would like to see the studies that you're citing in support of that um, so particular So that, that study idea. is the University of Washington Okay, study. and there are plenty of other studies in the United States that suggest essentially no difference in, for example, unwed pregnancy in the United States. But in can I have those studies? What, can you, can you have them? You can look at the pregnancy rates in California, New York, Massachusetts. I just gave you my reference. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to get, I'm happy to email you references <laughs> if you so please. I mean, 
this does happen to be a t this does happen to be a topic where there is social science on both sides. I'm not I'm not saying that you're the, the study that you're citing is invalid. I'm just suggesting that there is uh, a a difference in in data methods, and I'm suggesting that the the single motherhood rates in the West with comprehensive sex education are miles higher than they were in say the 1950s when there was not comprehensive sex education. So obviously that has not militated against the amount of unwed pregnancy happening in society. So the, the idea that the cure-all here is comprehensive sex ed, if you could prove to me, let's put it this way, if you could prove to me that comprehensive sex ed did result in lower levels of abortion, lower levels of unwed pregnancy, and that, that it was values neutral, comprehensive sex ed, in the sense that what it was actually teaching is, here is how to prevent a pregnancy without ending it in abortion, then I, I actually don't have a huge problem with that. It depends on the age at which you're teaching kids. There are, other, there are other issues that I have with comprehensive sex ed, including the fact that what is taught is not simp the simple biology of sex and how to prevent a pregnancy. Comprehensive sex ed simply goes a lot further than that, and I have serious moral problems with that. It seems like you're just trying to force women to not have, not say fuck. And, I mean, just to respond briefly to that, I'm, I'm confused as to, uh, the, the very language of, of forcing women into motherhood suggests that in a vast, vast, vast majority of cases in which women get pregnant, they had no part in the actual pregnancy-making act, which is not true. I've, I've done nothing. I, when, when you get, if you or any of your friends get pregnant, that is generally not having anything to do with, with me, per se. So I'm confused as to why I would want you to force it, anything. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Ben. Hi. That's going to be a really hard one to follow, I think, but <laughs> I will try. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. My question is uh, about your beliefs uh, on gay marriage, which I believe are informed by your practices as an Orthodox Jew. Is that right? Um, I, I will say yes and no. The yes only in the sense that yes, Orthodox Judaism is against gay marriage. And yes, I also have secular reasons for opposing gay marriage. I don't, I okay. don't make public policy based on, on my Judaic beliefs. I Which see. is why none of you keep kosher. I see. Okay. Well, uh, on the stance that you do hold that is informed by your um, Orthodox uh, Judaism beliefs, why do you think it's justifiable to extend these religious prohibitions on people who don't practice Orthodox Judaism? So I just said I didn't. So I mean, okay. so I'll start with that. And so, so so there's that. If you want to get, the, but that the, does the, inform your belief, though. Am I right in saying that that on, on a religious side, but not on a secular, uh, not on a secular moral side? So on a secular moral side, the argument against gay marriage is very is is not even an argument against you living a life that you want to live or anybody else living a life that they want to live without government subsidy. The question of what publicly subsidized marriage looks like. If you want to go to a pastor right now and do whatever you want to do, that's your, that's your prerogative. I don't have any problem with that. What I do have a problem with is when the state, which has to presumably have an interest in the sanctification of a relationship in order for them to sanctify the relationship, the question is what is the thing that is being sanctified by the state and why? So when I look at marriage, the purpose of marriage for literally all of human history was the bearing and rearing of children. The definition of marriage on a fundamental level sort of shifted culturally in the 1960s into two people who love each other. I agree that under that rubric, gay people count, right? Two men can love each other, two women, obviously. But under the rubric of are all human relationships created equal in terms of their utility to the state? And the utility to the state is two parents make baby, baby lives with married mom and dad. Then yes, of course, the, the form of marriage that ought to be subsidized is the form of marriage that produces children. And that's particularly true in the West that is currently reproducing at lo lower than replacement rates. Okay, yes. Um, I suppose I'd ask to that, um, do you have children? You, I presume you do have children. Four. When they grow up and when they leave the home, are you going to seek a divorce having fulfilled the sole purpose of marriage? Or is that... <laughs> I'm not asking that yeah. sarcastically, I mean it genuinely. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to catch you out here. I mean, I hope not. I hope my wife and I are getting along at that point. But, um, the, but the, the obvious answer to that is that parenthood does not end when your children leave the home. I mean, I'm still parenting my children. But the raising process, it, it, it the raising affect, process does. Well, no. I mean, I assume you're still in touch with your parents. I am in touch, but they're not raising me. I know, but they are still very much involved in your life. You, 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 how, they, how they interact with you makes a difference in your life, I would assume. And I think that's true for pretty much everybody who has live parents in the room. The parental relationship didn't end the minute that you left the house, I assume. So, and and that, parent, that parental relationship will continue up until the point that they die. I mean, but, I mean, this is actually a pretty interesting example that you're using because it's obviously true that even after kids leave the house, if their parents get divorced, that has a tremendous effect on a child. 
So to, to pretend that, that that relationship simply ends is, is not true. The, 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 the rearing process is lifelong. It is not a moment in time, in other words. Okay. I disagree with that, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. So my question is on gun control. So the Gun Violence Archive reported 647 mass shootings in the US in 2023 alone, 2022 alone. Sorry. Meanwhile, though tragic, there were only seven in the UK since 1996. Do you believe the marginal increase in freedom is worth the loss of life? So the answer as an American and as a Second Amendment advocate is yes, but it's not the same for every country. Meaning that in the UK, before the vast gun ban of the 1990s, there are not a lot of guns in circulation in the UK before that. And the number of mass shootings in the UK was similarly low before the mass ban. So the idea that the legislation in the United Nations, in the UK, sorry, in the United Kingdom, is what created the low level of gun crime is not true. There were low levels of gun crime well before that. Where you try to apply that same thing in Texas, say a vast gun ban in Texas, and you were going to try and grab all the guns in Texas, I promise you, you would have an immediate increase in the amount of gun crime, particularly against federal officers coming to get the guns. The entire purpose in the United States, the United States obviously being a revolutionary country against our, our motherland, uh, the, uh, the, the, the United States experiment was built on the idea of the, the gun being important in resistance to government tyranny as well as in terms of self-defense. Now, once a huge percentage of the population owns guns, once guns are, are readily available, the idea that you are going to be able to either full-scale confiscate or remove those guns in any practicable way is not true. That's certainly the case in the United States. And so anytime there's been a serious gun control regime that's been put in place in the United States, and there are many of them. Right? California has pretty ser serious gun control. Chicago has gun control. DC has gun control. The rates of gun violence have not gone down because the availability of guns remains widespread. It, typically, the rule is that people who follow the law tend to follow the law and criminals tend not to. The widespread availability of guns in the United States is not something that can simply be, be done away with. Now, as far as sort of the principled argument, the principled argument is that I'm a law-abiding citizen and I should be able to protect myself. That's, that, that, is the, that is the principled argument. So in small scale communities, for example, homeowners associations, there are, in many cases in the United States, gun bans. And I don't have a huge problem with that in the sense that you have a lot of social cohesion, you know all your neighbors, you have a security force that is quickly responsive to you. With that said, in a country of 340 million people that is incredibly diverse and where a huge percentage of the population has access to a gun, the idea of a widespread removal of Second Amendment rights would result in some pretty terrible things. So do you think there's a value to a cultural shift away from guns? Um, not necessarily. It depends where you are. So, so the, the, the idea that the... A, I want to think about it. It's, it's, an interesting, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, and again, I think it, it's, it's, so, it's kind of based on circumstance. I'm not sure the entire United States is similar in this way. So I, I like the idea of being able to protect myself and my family. I think owning a gun in order to do that is, is a good thing in the United States. I don't know what I would think if I hadn't grown up in a culture that, that actually values that. So um, what, would I see value in, in, in moving it away from that? I don't think it's that easy to move the culture away from that. So in terms of waving magic wands, I, 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 I'm running up against reality. But on, a, on an ideological level, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to it, frankly. And one quick smaller question. The UK is slowly phasing out certain types of knives by phasing out, I mean, making illegal to hold. What do you think about that? Because those knives are... There's no reason for a person to carry them as a British citizen, but... I mean, I, I don't know enough about knife policy in the UK. Uh, in the United States, we have, you know, tanks, so... <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, my question is uh, sort of going back to the topic of Israel and Palestine and specifically focused on Resolution uh, 242. And just to give a context to the audience, like what Resolution 242 is. So in 1967, the United Nations passed Resolution 242. And this uh, legislation requested that Israelite armed forces retreated from the territories occupied during uh, the recent conflict. From territories occupied, yes, not territory. the territories. Yes. This is actually a real uh, distinction yeah. in, in the law. Yes, it makes yes, a big yes, difference, territories. actually. Yeah, sorry. Um, and it also stressed the importance of resolving um, the refugee issue justly and also encouraged the end of the um, belligerency uh, claims in states. Um, however, the resolution did not explicitly state which territories um, Israel had to withdraw from uh, because of the ambiguities in the language of the English version versus the French version. Um, and this ambiguity kind of is being used as a resolution, like at, by, by the Israelites 
to justify its continued uh, occupation of some territories. And furthermore, um, although the resolution mentioned a just resolution for the refugee issue, um, it failed to clearly address the right of the Palestinian people to statehood. And from my understanding, that is the reason why a lot of the Arab nations sort of reject that resolution. So my question for you is, if you were in their shoe, if you're a Palestinian, um, aware that there's imprecise, impreciseness within the resolution um, that will potentially put your people in disadvantage, um, how would you respond to that and whether you will um, accept a partisan deal um, or will you reject it? And before you um, answer, I'm ready to be destroyed by Ben Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the, the answer, if I were a Palestinian citizen, which fortunately I'm not because it's horrible to live under the Palestinian Authority or Islamic Jihad right. or Hamas, um, but I if I were, I hope that what I, what I would be doing is pressing for a full-scale attempt at a, at a peace deal that would involve a two-state solution. The biggest problem with the two-state solution right now is that one side wishes to exist and the other side wishes it not to, and that's a, that's right. a serious problem. So if that were to alleviate, there's, mm -hmm. there's been heavy movement for decades in Israel for ceding territory, which is why Yasser Arafat was in charge of areas of the West Bank, which is why the Gaza Strip, which was completely ceded to the Palestinians in right. 2005. Israel removed 8,000 Jews from the Gaza Strip mm -hmm. in 2005. They did not have internal military presence in the Gaza Strip, which is why they didn't actually have any intelligence as to what was going on on October 7th. And so the, 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 the obvious answer would be that if a Palestinian government were to arise, that mm -hmm. were trustworthy and credible in its pledges not to actually attack and use their, their new state as a yeah. base for attack. And that would require time and trust, and that would have to be built up over time, given the amount of distrust in the region, which would mm -hmm. allow for presumably gradual, gradually increasing control of borders with, say, Jordan, right? If you're talking right. about yeah. the yeah. West Bank, it would also require land swaps. I mean, all these things have been discussed by Israel before. They were proposed in 2008 by Ehud Olmert. Mahmoud Abbas literally got up and walked away from the table without a counteroffer. Yeah. So when it comes to you know, the, 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 practic the, the practicality of solution, that rests on whether the Palestinians are willing to have a government at any point mm -hmm. that would actually make that peace deal. And it was interesting, I, I was at Oxford last night, the other university, I was, I was, at, uh, <laughs> I was, I was there last night, and, and student after student got up and asked about this, and then yeah. I asked them a simple question, they kept talking about occupied Palestine, I said, what do you mean by occupied Palestine? And invariably to a man yeah. or woman, each one of them said everything. Like from the river all the way to the sea, that's occupied. Well, you can't make peace yeah. on that basis, of, of course, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as far as whether Israel's been willing to do it, yes, Israel will be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. But again, that's going to take time and it's going to take credibility. That's what Oslo was supposed to do, and it never even came remotely close to achieving that credibility, largely because Yasser Arafat is one of the worst people who has ever lived and an arch terrorist. Mm -hmm. So uh, what would be, like, sort of your solution to that? What would you propose if you're the one that's mitigating the deal between Israel and Palestine? I mean, right now, there's no deal to be actually mediated between, between right, the two parties. Just in the hypothetical I, scenario. In the magical hypothetical deal, it would end up yeah. looking like the Palestinian areas that are currently governed by the, that, that are currently largely Palestinian would end up under Palestinian control. It would look like land swaps, probably, right. where the Israeli areas outside the Green Line, like Afrat, which has 30,000 citizens living out there, yeah. that was not going to end up in Palestinian control. You're going to have to have a land swap somewhere else. I mean, that, that's, everybody sort of acknowledges that that is the, the, the way that it would, would go. Even, even Likud, which started off anti-Oslo, mm -hmm. once that was the reality on the ground, started to embrace a lot of the language of the two-state solution. So, again, I think that the, 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 everyone in the West is trying to jump to the solution without recognizing the failure of the premise. If you have two parties who are willing to make a deal, a deal is available. Mm -hmm. And if you only have one party who's willing to make a deal, a deal is not available. Right. right now, only one party is willing to make a deal. The other party has shown itself repeatedly, literally for all of Israeli history, unwilling to make a deal. There's not been a single deal accepted by the Palestinian Arabs or by their predecessors. When I say their predecessors, I mean the, the Arabs who were in Palestine, didn't consider themselves nationally Palestinian at the time. People who were Syrian, people who were Turkish. The Peel Commission in 1937 recommended a significantly smaller state of Israel. The Jews accepted it. Yeah. The Arabs rejected it. This has happened over and over and over. 37, 48, happened again in 2000, happened again in 2008. Like over and over and over and over. So, again, the, it all comes back to the same point. Once there's a peace partner, you can talk. Until there's a peace partner, there's no talks. Thank you so much. I feel being destroyed. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll start by quoting one of your videos. You say, I know it's, uh, by the way, my question is on climate change. Okay. Um, you say, Thank you for allowing me to prepare myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're saying, um, I know it's hot outside. You know what I can do about it? Zero things. Thank God we have this thing called air conditioning. It's awesome. You know, it's a great cure when it's super duper hot being in a first world country. 
So I agree that as individual, you actually have no power to mitigate global capitalism-induced uh, ecological breakdown. Um, therefore, I'm curious about your views on structural government policies, such as net zero strategies, um, especially having in mind that this year we saw devastating wildfires in North America and Australia, which is the first world, and that also sadly burned the houses with the said air conditioning. So when it comes to wildfires, first of all, a lot of controversy as to whether the extent of wildfires, which actually have not become more common over time, whether the extent of the damage of wildfires is driven by climate change or whether it's driven also by bad forestry policy. There's been a major issue in the state of California. There's a major issue in Montana where they had a major wildfire in the United States as well. When it comes to net zero policies, my big problem with net zero policies is that they are impracticable. This is my big problem. China is not signing on. India is not signing on. They're the two greatest polluters on planet Earth. For all the talk about the evils of global capitalism, it turns out that the giant communist state is the biggest polluter on Earth. China, by a large margin, it is not close. Okay, when it comes to other countries that are not first world countries, they have very little interest in whether or not they are emitting carbon, given the fact that many people are so poor they are burning dung for fuel. And it turns out that when you are attempting to survive past the age of 40, it's much higher priority for you to be able to survive using the resources at your disposal, including the single most effective and efficient source of energy on the planet, carbon-based fossil fuels, that is more important to you than whether it's going to warm incrementally over the course of the next 100 years. What human beings are good at and what human beings are bad at are two separate categories. Human beings are very, very bad at mitigation and we are very, very good at adaptation. So we stink at the, at, when, when it comes to, if you guys, if, you, if we save a penny today, we'll save a pound tomorrow. Human beings suck at this. we are really bad at it, which is why everybody in Europe, everybody in America, we're, we're, I'm just, pr 10 years from now, we're all gonna be doing austerity because we're gonna be forced into it because everybody's bad at this logic. But what human beings are very good at is adaptation, which is why human beings migrate, which is why human beings build new inventions and innovate. So, one of the th so if I'm going to invest resources, the things that I'm going to invest resources in are going to be not telling everybody they have to drive their car less, which is likely to be wildly unsuccessful. What I'm going to instead invest my money is in building, is building better levees in New Orleans. So when the hurricane does hit, the entire town doesn't get flooded. Right? Building better infrastructure, mitigating the damage is where the money actually should be going and is gonna be a lot more practical in both the near and the long term than attempting to, what, tell everybody that they're, uh, to turn their air conditioner to 75 or, or tell everybody that they can't drive their car as much. Meanwhile, you're not, half the globe is not on board with any of that, right? Half the globe doesn't care about that and they're not going to care about that until ironically they've reached first world standards via the power of capitalism. So the, my, my big problem with, with the climate change argument is not whether it's happening. I'm fully willing to accept that anthropogenic climate change is a reality. My big problem is that the solutions that are being proposed for that are not in any way serious or practical. The only way that human beings have ever gotten out of problems of this sort is through innovation. And, and the, the real litmus test is who is willing to humor nuclear power. Right, that's the real litmus test. Many of the same people who are trying to push against mitigating factors on climate change are also pushing against nuclear power, which seems to me totally crazy. Uh, thanks. A couple of fact-checking things. I actually graduated this year and now work as a climate economist. I did my dissertation on climate disasters, so actually um, uh, there are multiple studies saying that wildfires and other climate disasters are caused by climate change and their increase are definitely caused by climate change. Also, China emits, emits much less CO2 per capita than U.S. Oh, or per Germany. Capita, per capita. Oh, yeah, they, but that still kind of matters. Well, no, what, what actually matters is the amount of carbon that's going in the air. That's what actually matters. Yeah, but then, like, who to blame when we are answering the question who to blame for CO2 emissions? America's carbon emissions have been going like this, and China's carbon emissions are going like this. So if I'm, fo if I'm focusing on who is to blame, I'm probably going to try to focus on the people who are going like this, not the people who are going like this. Sure, go ahead. Um, just um, the last question, and if, if I'm fine to answer. So uh, your solution to climate change is adaptation, so more technologies, which is great. Uh, my question is, when it comes to actually developing countries that are bearing most of the cost of climate disasters and climate change, and they do not obviously have the money to implement all of those high-costing technologies that the developed world can, what would be solution for them? I mean, the solution for them presumably would be in terms of mitigating against climate change, the, the building seawalls for them too. I mean, if, the, if, if we can give our foreign aid to corrupt foreign governments to embezzle, then we can certainly attempt to build some seawalls in low-lying coastal areas of third world countries. That seems like if you're gonna give foreign aid, that seems like not a terrible place to, to give the foreign aid. 
But as far as I, I, I do reject the generalized argument that the first world owes it to the third world because of climate change, because the first world is the first world and the third world is the third world. I just fundamentally reject the idea that capitalism has been a process of exploitation of the third world and enrichment of the first world when literally half the world's global poor disappeared because they are not global poor anymore by, by UN standards over the course of the last 50 years, thanks entirely to the magic of capitalism. So you can't take the benefits and then reject the downsides. I don't think it works that way. All right, thank you, and free Palestine. Which, which part? <laughs> really? It's, 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 a, it's a serious question. What, what is it? I mean, I saw you say from the river to the sea, so you can just say it out loud. Yeah, from the river to the sea. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I appreciate, I appreciate the idea that the Jewish state should be wiped completely off the map with the concomitant loss of life. But we're worried about climate change and the humanitarian aspects of climate change over the course of the next hundred years, sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Oscar. Um, so we're moving back to the floor now. Is there anyone on the floor who'd like to ask Ben a question? And we'll get to you a mic. I no see one? a lot okay. of hands. I think we'll head over here first. Can we get a mic over there? Yeah. Quiet, please. Can we have a question from over here? Uh, thank you for coming, Ben. Um, I was hoping to ask you about uh, fiscal policy. I know you spoke before about the idea of uh, government intervention and incentives. I was wondering if you could speak to the idea of austerity, which I, I know you referenced briefly before. Here in the UK, we've had austerity since 2010. We've seen... Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, here in the UK, we've seen significant austerity since 2010. Uh, we've seen stagnating growth, increasing child poverty, increasing adult poverty, for the first time since I think World War II, it's had an increase in the child mortality rate. Um, we've also seen quite similar phenomena during the Great Depression years um, here in the UK between 1929 and 1939. I was wondering if you could speak to the idea that you think that's not a as a result of austerity and why you disagree, sorry, uh, why you think that austerity policies will produce more benefit well, than in, fiscal in, spending. So in, in, the, so in the short term, austerity policies do hurt, obviously. I mean, when people get dependent on the government, the government spends oodles and oodles of money, and then the, and then the money disappears. The incentive structures change, and that, and that creates an enormous amount of suffering in the short term, which is why you should try to take care of these problems before you reach austerity in the first place. The, the idea of debt-led growth cannot be sustainable forever is sort of the argument, that eventually you have to pay the bill. And when the bill does have to get paid, you only have a few choices. One is to radically increase taxes, which leads to business stagnation, much of the stagnation that you're talking about. Now you have just a series of really, really bad options. Right, so I'm not recommending austerity in terms of you know, preemptive austerity. I'm recommending restructuring these things in ways that actually are sustainable. Now, I'm also not a big believer that the government is, is doing the right thing in injecting itself into every area of the economy and creating replacement level economies rooted in government, because again, that can only be based on somebody else's money. So my, my general objection to national economic policy is that you're substituting giant swaths of the market and putting it in the hands of bureaucrats who tend to know much less about what you want on an individual level from your healthcare or from anything else than, than you do, and who, are very, and who have an incentive structure that is loaded toward inertia and not toward change and competitiveness and innovation. So, again, I, I, I'm not going to deny that austerity results in suffering. Of course, austerity results in suffering. The question is how you avoid the austerity in the first place. And the answer to that is you don't get in bed with the government if you don't expect to get screwed. Super, thank you. Uh, let's go over that side. Can we get a microphone to that hand? That one, just sort of... I can't really see the person. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you for coming, Ben. I have a question on gun control. You raised two main points. Firstly, that it's impractical and ineffective to take guns away from a society like the US, which already has guns. And secondly, that you have an ideological belief in the right to bear arms. Does the second point fully justify a lack of gun control? And to give an example, would you recommend that the UK adopt a Second Amendment in order to satisfy the right to bear arms? Or would you think that once you've rid a society of guns, that it's good to keep it that way. So uh, I think it depends on the threat level to the society and, this, and the level of society, societal fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that it, it, the answer is that 
I, I do believe ideologically in the right to bear arms to protect yourself. However, I think that the right to bear arms does not include owning nuclear weapons, for example. <laughs> right? Like the, so in, in my situation, I, I also believe that, that threat levels are different to different populations. And so it depends who you are in society. It depends how well the society can protect you. And it depends on the, the possibility of a government going truly tyrannical and violating your core rights. And so that's not going to be the same between every society. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant always to speak on, on foreign countries because I know way less about them. You know, I, I know way less about Britain, as I've said, than, than virtually anybody in the room. Um, but when it comes to the idea, if you have a functional system, I'm very hesitant to tamper with functional systems as a, as a, as a general rule. And do you, really, do you believe the UK is a functional system in terms of gun control? Um, I mean, I think that the UK is, I, I would have to look at the murder rates and I would have to look at where the crime is located and I have to look at, in the US. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm going to beg off for lack of data. I mean, before I start making policy recommendations in the UK and running for parliament, I feel like I should know a little bit more uh, about your country. I can't even spell correctly here. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, super. Um, over on this side, the hand in the corner over there, please. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about the internet and how we debate. I'm wondering what you think about this sort of internet bubbling thing where people get views that are regurgitated and agree with them. And whether that feeds into the way we debate, where we debate with slogans, you know, Brexit means Brexit, we've had enough of experts to choose a right-wing example, because I think that's more amenable to the audience, um, as opposed to actually engaging with the substance of what people believe. And whether that feeds into the cancel culture that we're seeing in our society, that it's almost, if you like, an emotional response to not being able to support what you believe, because it's being reinforced by you just seeing this. Well, sir, I mean, certainly the internet has made us more atomized. The promise of the internet, which is that we would all be more interconnected, was only true in the sense that we're more pissed off at each other. Um, but, but the idea that the internet has been a great unifying body, and the, I'm speaking as someone who's made a lot of money off the internet, uh, that the, the internet has been just an unalloyed good in terms of the political discourse is obviously untrue. The echo chambers that have emerged are, are really a problem. It's why I make a habit. I mean, I, I have people on my show on a fairly regular basis who disagree with me. I try to have conversations with people who disagree with me. Actually. Alex and I just had a conversation today in which we completely disagreed on everything religion related, and it was a lot of fun. It was really enjoyable. So, you know, I, I agree with you that the, the current online, but I will say there is a subsection of the internet that is quite good, right? There is a subsection of the internet where people actually are having these long form conversations and they're becoming increasingly popular. I think that, you know, a lot of the formats are not conducive to this. TikTok, obviously, not conducive to it. Snapchat, not conducive. Like anything that's like a minute or less is not going to be conducive to that sort of thing. But long form audio is actually having a moment right now, and I think that is quite a good thing. So I, I, I want to, you know, talk about the benefits as well as the drawbacks. But yes, the sort of algorithmic siloing is incredibly dangerous and leads people to believe that their arguments are convincing when they are not, and leads them to believe that they don't have to examine the other side of the argument because everybody else is just a dumbass, because that's what people on the internet say. Thanks, Ben. And can we go, the lady with the hand up just here, please. Um, uh, thanks for speaking. Uh, this is a political question, uh, mostly about America, but also the West in general. Um, do you think, because of the rise of extremes in political views, um, almost what do you think will happen to a lot of Western political systems? Like, will they collapse or will they have to drastically alter themselves to kind of maintain order? So I think that what we're actually seeing is a fragmentation of the body politic over, over viewpoint. And that's resulting in a lot of polarization, especially because the top level governments do have so much power. So in the United States, which again, I'm going to speak about the US because that's what I know best. Uh, in the United States, the federal government simply has too much power, which means that everybody's incredibly invested in federal politics in a way they're not invested in the stuff they should be invested in, which is actually local politics, like how their actual local community is government, governed. So if you believe that the federal government is going to step in and is going to simply squash you, then it becomes a matter of life and death who the president of the United States is when for much of American history, no one actually cared all that much who the president of the United States was and didn't seem to make a huge level of difference. In fact, huge swaths of the, of the 19th century were precisely that. Uh, the, the maximization of the power at the top level is a real problem. And this is something that Montesquieu was talking about hundreds of years ago. I mean, the idea of devolution of authority to the lowest available level so you can have more homogenous communities deciding for themselves how they wish to live and let their neighbors live as they wish to live. And then the amount of authority delegated reducing as you move up the chain. I think that's, that's the good way out of this. The bad way out of this is 
violence, fracturing, mass riots in the streets, people reacting very strongly to that by electing ever more polarized governments in order to hit the enemy. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's incredibly dangerous. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of federalism in the United States, and I think there needs to be more of it pretty much everywhere. Localism yeah. and federalism are an answer to a lot of these questions. And do you think that riots and stuff are inevitable? Um, I, I, again, I think that when people are, uh, feel as though they have lost control of a situation, uh, they, they tend to riot. And I think that's also, again, fomented by the internet culture that, that does favor the most extreme expressions of viewpoints. I wouldn't even say the most extreme viewpoints because I'm not sure that's even true. It's the most extreme expressions of the viewpoints. And the most extreme expression of any viewpoint is going to be violence. Thank you. Can we go front and middle here, please? Hiya. I wanted to ask um, about gay marriage, which I didn't think we properly duped out earlier. Um, you may disagree, but I felt your argument for the secular side of uh, opposing gay marriage was that you feel the state sort of advantages marriage because it's a, a useful thing for society. Um, I find that very odd because I don't feel that that's why we have rights and freedoms in society. Um, if we're being utilitarian in the US, you know, a lot of our rights make governance harder. So thinking of the First Amendment, that makes societal harmony a lot harder. The Second Amendment makes saving lives a lot harder. Shouldn't secular debate on gay marriage be focused mostly on the pursuit of happiness over what's useful? So again, I'm going to hone in on the definition of rights in, in what you're saying. So when, you, when I say right to gay marriage, as I expressed earlier, I think that you have a right to go down to your local church and have anybody sign any document that you want. What you're actually talking about is a government benefit. When the government says that it sanctifies marriage, that comes along with certain legal procedures. Otherwise, I don't think the government should be in the business at all. Let me make that clear. If it's just about getting a government piece of paper that says magically your marriage is now sanctified by a bunch of politicians, I don't give a shit about that at all. It makes no difference to me. I have, two, I have two marriage documents in my possession. One is my religious marriage document, which I actually care about. And then I have the secular marriage document, which I don't even remember the date of and is buried somewhere in the garage. I don't care about it at all because I don't rely on the state to sanctify my personal relationships. And frankly, I think if you do rely on the state to sanctify your personal relationships, you need better relationships and you need better institutions. Again, politicians and bureaucrats giving you a piece of paper should not make you feel better about your relationship. The, the whole purpose of the debate over gay marriage should have been over whether certain forms of marriage are beneficial to the state or not because it's about the benefits that accrue. I think that it actually morphed into something else because there was an attempt, I think, by some people to suggest that because the state hits a stamp on a piece of paper, this grants quote unquote moral credibility to the thing. I'm not in favor of the state granting, be, being the arbiter of moral credibility on personal relationships in general. I just don't, I, I don't think that that's the state's business. I do think that it's the state's business to incentivize or disincentivize particular types of behavior. And in this case, I don't think it's the state's business to, to disincentivize particular types of sexual relationship. But I do think that it's very much in the state's interest to incentivize particular types of familial relationships. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And um, we'll go back corner over there, please. Um, my question is going to be about the Israel-Palestine issue, and, and let it be known that I'm not a big from the river to the sea kind of person. Um, my question is about your claim about uh, Israel uh, having always having its doors open to peace for a two-state solution, and I just don't think this narrative is true. I don't think that any Israeli prime minister since Yitzhak Rabin has really had their doors open for peace. And Yitzhak Rabin, the most open for peace Israeli prime minister of all time, was shot by an Israeli extremist um, who was motivated by um, Jewish, Jewish fundamentalism, um, which as a Jew I find really appalling that that was the closest we've ever got to peace and it was our very own religious fundamentalists that stopped that from happening. Um, I don't think that Israel does currently have its doors open for peace. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has made his voice opposed to the two-state solution very often. Israel is under the control of a, a minority settler population who are not willing to give up on the land of Judea and Samaria, which, land, which is land that needs to be given up in order to achieve peace. 
So I just don't think this is true. And yes, I don't think Hamas has its doors open for peace either. But this does not change the fact that Israel is culpable for also this current situation in which it is not willing to negotiate because it views the entire land as its own. Look at the nation state law, uh, the Judea, Samaria, Golan, everything. It's all meant to be exclusive Jewish sovereignty. Okay, so. Let's talk about the history for a second. To suggest that the last Israeli prime minister who's in favor of peace was Yitzhak Rabin, I'm sorry, but it's just historically inaccurate. Shimon Peres, who was Yitzhak Rabin's partner in the peace plan, was prime minister. Ehud Barak, who is so far to the left that he makes Yitzhak Rabin look like a piker, was the prime minister and offered a peace deal in 2000. Ehud Olmert offered a, an, an incredibly generous peace deal, much, much greater even than the 2000 peace deal, rejected by Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas. So that's just historically inaccurate. The idea that Yitzhak Rabin was simply willing, even at the time, this is not even what the Oslo Accords say. The Oslo Accords really kind of embody some of the things that I was saying about a gradualistic process of surrender of some parts of the land, which is why you still have areas A, B, and C. When it comes to the idea that Israel as a whole is somehow culpable for a terrorist group that calls for its extermination, running into its center and murdering 1,500 Jews is deeply immoral. That's deeply immoral. You're not talking about people who are arguing in favor of some sort of land for peace settlement. The people who ran in are arguing for the extirpation of every Jew from the region. Every Jew. And as far as the idea that Israel is somehow ethnically intolerant as opposed to its neighbors, that's untrue as well. Israel is 20% Arab. Gaza has zero Jews. Zero. The Palestinian Authority has zero Jews living under its authority, nor could they be trusted to have Jews living under their authority, given the fact that when Jews accidentally drive into Ramallah, they're in danger of being lynched, which is certainly not true of the tens of thousands of Palestinians who every single day are given work permits into Israel, including, by the way, people from the Gaza Strip who had work permits into Israel, some of whom then went back and gave information to Hamas on the specific locations and number of people in each house in these various Moshevim, those are the villages, in the Gaza envelope. So to suggest that, that, this is, that it's Bibi Netanyahu's fault, that Hamas murdered 1,500 people, by, by the, again, ignoring the fact that Hamas has been firing rockets on Israel continuously for about a 17-year period at this point, spanning governments of both the left and the right. Bibi Netanyahu wasn't even prime minister a year and a half ago. It was Yair Lapid, who is very much to the left. So to, to make the argument that somehow Israel has a responsibility to make a quote-unquote two-state solution with the current partners is totally crazy. Wh who, who's the partner? It would be one thing to argue if there was a liberal-minded partner that actually sought peace. But what you're talking about is a Palestinian The most liberal partner that is there is the Palestinian Authority, which right now, today, is paying Hamas terrorists a stipend for having killed Jews. Those are not people you can make a peace deal with. I mean, I, un I understand that Hamas is not a group you can make peace with, but I do think that Israel has made a concerted effort to destroy every group it could possibly make peace deal with. In Please 2019, Netanyahu said that the best way to stop Palestinian statehood, which is his aim, was to fund and empower Hamas in order to further the divide between Gaza and West Bank. This is what he believed should be done in order to prevent Palestinian statehood. And second, when you talk about Ehud uh, Barak, Ehud Barak um, as being a leader who was very willing to open a peace deal, I think that the reason why the 2000 peace deal failed was because ultimately... Uh, Israel was not willing to give up control over the Temple Mount, which is for Muslims the Alaska compound, which is something as a secular Jew I think should have been given up in order for peace, but I can understand that religious people might struggle with that. But at the same time, I think that um, Arafat was under a condition where he could not have given up uh, permanently sovereignty over Alaska compound because he would have had a fatwa in, uh, against him. Okay, so your argument is actually my argument which is that Arafat could not have accepted a peace deal offered to him because his own people would have murdered him for having made any sort of peace deal, which, by the way, I agree with. I think not that's true. Not any sort of peace deal, a peace deal that gave up the Temple Mount. And I would no, have liked... No, that's... that's that, okay, so the, 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 the idea that, first of all, we should point out that having been on the Temple Mount multiple times... The I've temple... tried. I dressed up as a Muslim to try and get onto the Temple Mount. Well, yeah, you... <laughs> there's, a, there's a picture of that happening. By the way, you don't... You don't... <laughs> so... If... If, 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 you, if, you, if you'd like the hookup, I can make it happen. It's huh? not difficult. You, all you have to do is walk up a particular tunnel, and you can go out onto the Temple Mount. Anyone can, but only Muslims can pray there. Only Muslims can pray on the Temple Mount. That is the I current went on the law. wrong day. It wasn't open to foreigners that day. I mean, um, but I tried I'm anyway. just telling you, it is a fact of the matter. I've seen people arrested for attempting to pray, to open a prayer book that is in Hebrew on the Temple Mount. Only Muslims can pray 
on the Temple Mount. The Islamic Waqf is in technical control of the Temple Mount. So to put aside the politics of the Temple Mount for a second, once again, the argument that I'm making is that there is no party on the other side. Please name the party on the other side with which the Israelis should currently negotiate. Not currently, because I, as I've said, so then we Israel, has tried, you know, Israel has assassinated leading Arab academics, leading Palestinian academics. Uh, when, when it, when, during the Nakba in 1948, Israel kept largely rural areas in the Galilee intact, but they went after um, urban areas where there were Palestinian academics. There had been a concerted effort to make sure that I, I think... You're saying, you're saying the war strategy of the Israelis in 1948 was to go after Palestinian academics? Not I mean, academics, uh, that, they went after, they they went after urban, urban Palestinian life. It turns out that wars typically take place in heavily urbanized areas and not in open fields. I mean, it was a largely rural area at the time, so I don't think that's right either, so... Well, I mean, that happens to be right. The biggest battles around the 1948 <laughs> war, of, war of Independence the Battle of Latrun, which is a battle between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, to open the road to Jerusalem. There were, there were hotly fought battles in the streets of Safed, Tzfat. So, I mean, there, there were battles in every populated area of, of the region, clearly, because it was a war for the establishment of the State of Israel. So, once it... Uh, first of all, not particularly unusual, considering that the Allies, including this country, promptly to, after World War II depopulated Poland to the turn to the to the the sound of two million Germans depopulated from Poland back into Germany, repatriated back into Germany that nobody ever talks about. Nobody's talking today about the fact that right now I'm not a big fan of Okay, I think we need to wrap up there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben, for being here tonight. And can we have one round, last round of applause for all the contributors tonight, the questions? <laughs> okay. I really appreciate it.